Iowans are already casting ballots. What's the closing message to voters, and how are the state parties helping get out the vote? We'll talk with Iowa Democratic Party Chair Rita Hart on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Elite Casino Resorts is rooted in Iowa. Elite's 1,600 employees are our company's greatest asset. A family-run business, Elite supports volunteerism, encourages promotions from within, and shares profits with our employees. Across Iowa, hundreds of neighborhood banks strive to serve their communities, provide jobs, and help local businesses. Iowa banks are proud to back the life you build. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you political leaders and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond, celebrating more than 50 years on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, October 18th edition of Iowa Press. Here is Kay Henderson. On this edition of Iowa Press and next week, viewers will be hearing from the leaders of Iowa's two major political parties. This week's guest is Iowa Democratic Party Chair Rita Hart. She's here to talk about the days, the dwindling days between now and November 5th, Election Day. Thanks for being here. Absolutely happy to be here, Kay. Thank you so much for the invite. Also joining the conversation, Dave Price of the Gray television stations in Iowa and Aaron Murphy of the Gazette in Cedar Rapids. Uh, Chair Hart, if we could start it. First of all, congratulations on already getting the crops harvested. That's probably your biggest accomplishment of the year. So yeah, props to you on that I'm and careful you and your hubby. To, to be too braggy here yeah. in front of the rest of the farmers yeah. out there. So Good point. Hey, can we, I want to turn the page back a little bit to this summer. Uh, back a couple months ago, we had two of your congressional candidates, Christina Bohannon and Sarah Corkery, saying that it was time for President Biden to step aside for somebody else to become your party's nominee. At the time, you had declined to do that. As we now look at this whole process, is your party better off by having Kamala Harris as its nominee? Was that the right call? I think the that w what we're better off for is that President Biden himself made this decision, right? He with he some help, though, right? Well, we every decision we make, we you know we take input from others, and I think that is really what um, a lot of Iowa Democrats um, were thinking: is you know where is he at, at the, in this in this uh, decision? And so he made a decision, and he stepped aside, and he, as he said, he handed this down to a new generation. And as a result, um, folks are recognizing that that was such a selfless thing to do, and it was um, a good thing to do for the Democratic Party for this particular race, because it has energized um, the Democratic Party in this, in this contest, and we've seen nothing but positive as a result. You know, I, I'm, it's, it's kind of amazing to me that that, that that could take place, that when he handed that off to um, Kamala Harris, that all these other people who had great ambitions also saw what, was, what um, Joe Biden was leading us to and said, you know what, we're going to get behind this candidacy as well. And did you really at the time not have an opinion or did you not think it was your place to say it? Again, I, th I think that it really mattered where Joe Biden was on this and that the way this transpired was exactly, um, you know, the right kind of decision making in a democratic process. Uh, for people uh, who have forgot the timing of this, uh, this happened on a Sunday um, in July. And then you spoke to reporters and said, I'm not saying I'm endorsing a candidate at this moment. I need to talk to the other delegates to the Democratic National Convention. And then a few hours later, the Harris campaign announced that you'd endorsed her. So how fast did this move? And what led you to make that decision so quickly? So again, you know, I'm the chair of the Democratic Party. I, when I make a decision or, or make a, um, a, a decision like that, 
I need to take in what the, what the will of the majority is in our Democratic Party, right? And so the, those delegates that were going to convention um, needed to have an, a moment to decide what they wanted to do. And so we had those conversations, and it was quick. My goodness, it was quick, right? But I was surprised at how quickly our delegates came together and said, we are going to be behind Kamala Harris. And that's, and that's now where we are. So you mentioned the engagement, the enthusiasm. Um, we've been hearing that anecdotally from Democrats and Democratic candidates. I'm looking at some voter registration numbers now from, from Iowa, and the Democratic Party has picked up about 16,000 new, uh, well, more registrations since July, an increase of about 3.4 percent. Where are these folks coming from? How much are they going to help uh, your party's candidates in this election? So I, I, I can't answer that question. We'd have to analyze that a bit. But um, the enthusiasm that you mentioned is very real. You know, as I travel across the state, Democrats are very fired up. And I would say even more importantly, they are determined, right? They want to see um, Kamala Harris and Tim Walls get elected. And they are excited about the fact that these, that these two people represent um, a future that is positive, that's going to um, stand up for the things that, that Iowa Democrats stand for as well, that they are going to be making sure that women have reproductive decisions, that they, that they have control over their own bodies. They're, they're, they're excited about the fact that we have leadership that um, recognizes that public, educa public school education is really important. I think here in Iowa, we're especially thrilled about uh, Tim Walz's um, step up to the vice presidency because he is that teacher, that coach, that background that says public education is important and that when you send kids to public school and they're hungry, we ought to feed them. Common sense kinds of, of decision making that we're hungry for here in Iowa. Um, Harkening back to the Romney ticket, there was a Wisconsinite on that ticket, and people thought, well, that'll be big in Iowa. It'll really help him in Iowa. It didn't turn out to be. Is Walls really helping in Iowa? He hasn't campaigned here. Yeah, I think that, again, it's representative of the decision-making that Kamala Harris is, is, um, is making, right? That she chose a, um, a common-sense um, person who is going to lead us um, down this path that's going to be good for the average American, the average Iowan. Um, that's what I think is going to make a difference um, and, and the, why there's so much excitement around this, this uh, ticket. Well, and on that, I should also note the Republicans have also added to their voter registration numbers in the same time. Not as much. Uh, they've increased about 2 percent over the same period. But are they canceling out any surge that you're seeing? D do you need to, to boost those numbers even more to be able to help your candidates uh, across the state? Yeah, I think, you know, again, uh, the, that's why it's uh, really crucial that we are going out and talking to folks and telling them how important their vote is. Not everybody changes their voter registration when they have changed their mind on who they're going to vote for, right? And so when this election is over, we'll be able to go back and, and really take a good hard look at, at where the movement is and, and who we're talking about. But I think, again, to have um, a younger person at the, at the top of the ticket is, inciting, is, is uh, exciting to our younger voters um, and to those people who are looking for um, a, a direction um, on the issues that uh, Democrats really care about, on child care accessibility, on health care, on mental health. Um, these are the issues that I think are going to really be the drivers. And again, this election is all about turnout. And so, again, that's why I'm traveling the state. That's why um, we, we're excited that we have so many great candidates who have stepped up because of the situation that has existed here in Iowa, where they've seen that Republicans being in control has, has ended up in extreme legislation that people do not support and is not popular. And so our candidates have said, hey, something's got to change. And now we have voters who can get behind those candidates and, um, and change things. Before we move on, I'm sorry. I just got to ask, follow up on something you said there. Are you sure that Iowa voters are not in line with what we've seen at the Capitol that you're mentioning? Because it's not all that different from what we've seen in previous election cycles, and that has not hurt state house Republicans here. Yeah, well, so we've got we've had some changes in that direction, right? You know, this uh, six-week abortion ban has now become reality. 
And as a result, people understand that this is um, affecting the, the health care choices for all women across Iowa. That I think people are much more aware that today um, Iowa is dead last in OBGYNs per capita and that um, that is going to really end up in, with negative health outcomes for women of any age, right? And they've also seen that the, um, that the decisions to take private, to take taxpayer money and put it into um, private schools instead of the public school um, system is not only um, detrimental to public school as a whole, but particularly detrimental to our rural schools who don't have the same choices as, as people who live in, in urban areas. And that just isn't, that doesn't uh, strike Iowans correctly. I want to bounce back to maybe to piggyback off what Kay was talking about. If we look at the Des Moines Register's Iowa poll from last month, the gap between Trump and Harris was only 4% compared to 18% when it was Trump-Biden back in June. As Kay pointed out, we don't have the candidates coming here. They're kind of coming on the, on the outside of the state a little bit. But 4%, traditionally, we'd kind of call that swing state. It's almost within the margin of error. By the way, Ann Seltzer does these polls. Why is there not a belief outside of our border that this is a true... Winnable. Is this winnable for Kamala Harris, or are people not on board and believe in this? I just think this is such a tight race nationally, and um, I know we were all surprised at that Seltzer poll, right? It was not, you know, that's a big leap, right? So it is an indicator that nobody was quite ready for. And because this is such a close race across the nation, and the attention has always been on what's been considered, um, these um, these tight races in places like Georgia and Pennsylvania, that maybe it's take it's a little bit hard to make that shift. But I tell you what, it's not lost on us here in Iowa. You know that's why we're focusing so you know so hard on Democratic voter turnout and making sure that we are educating folks on what um, what is at stake here and what our candidates have to offer. But you would would you like Kamala Harris in the state of Iowa before November fifth? We would always welcome Kamala Harris. We would always welcome Tim Walls. Um, you and get him? I, <laughs> I drop some news here? I can't. No, <laughs> I, no, no news is going to be okay. done in that. But yes, they are welcome here anytime. Okay. You mentioned uh, already the impact, or, or I'm sorry, the issue of abortion, women's reproductive health care, IVF. It, it Maybe especially at the congressional level, is that a issue or bust for Democratic candidates? Is that the issue that's going to carry them across the finish line in, in these races? Or is there a more well-rounded message that these candidates have? Yeah, I think it's really clear that this is a very salient issue in this time, especially because we have some Republican congressional representatives who have not been listening to Iowa residents, right, on this issue. And, and they've not really been honest about it, right? They have, they have voted for abortion bans and then come back to Iowa and say, oh, well, you know, I really believe in exceptions. Well, they have not, um, they have not walked the walk and talked the talk. They are, they are saying one thing and voting a different way. And that, I think, is a bigger issue than anything, right, is the honesty that comes out of can we trust what you say when you, then you vote differently than, than your rhetoric um, resounds. So, but overall, I would say that, um, that freedom is always a big issue. And the fact that people today have fewer rights than they did it is really resounding well with people. But there are other issues too, so. Speaking you know. of. Yeah, speaking of, uh, your, your family's financial position is always something that's a motivator for a lot of people. Absolutely. If you start looking at the polls, those would show that Trump has the advantage with this. Can you articulate the economic message that will get somebody off the couch who's kind of on the fence about, do I want to vote, do I not want to vote? And maybe to crystallize it, if somebody stops you and says, how, how do you answer the question, are you better off today than you were four years ago? How do you respond to people? Well, for one thing, I think that um, some... In some cases, there's been a lot of revisionist history here that four years ago, maybe um, if we actually went back there, we'd find out that things were a little bit different than some folks remember that, you know. Um, those, that was a tough time four years ago as we were dealing with a pandemic and the economic ramifications thereof. And and what the message that I think 
Democrats have is that we have always been the party for the middle class and that it's really important to Democrats that that people have good jobs, good paying jobs, that they can count on the security of those jobs and that we are making sure that that our system works for everybody um, up and down the scale. And that's why it was such a um, important thing for Joe Biden to talk about how he was building the economy from the bottom up and the middle out, because we're not building an economy for those people who have the financial advantages already. And that's what we can look forward to if we go back to a Trump presidency, that you know his big accomplishment was a tax cut for the wealthy and did not do much for the middle class. And that's where Democratic candidates are focused on, is what can we do to lower the costs for average Americans? And that's why people have responded well to the fact that, that, that we've lowered prescription drug costs, that, we are, that we're working for fair wages, that we are, uh, that we are trying to make um, um, corporate America count, accountable for the, the inflation that exists today. But when you look at some of these stats, wages are outpacing inflation the last 18 months, and right now they're almost going up twice as fast. Your paycheck's going up almost twice as fast as the cost of everything. Gas prices are down. Stock markets have been records all year long. We've set a gazillion records uh, with the Dow. There still seems to be a disconnect, though, when you start going out talking to people about this, though, are, are, you, are you not concerned that that message, your message, is not clicking well enough with people? Well, that is, again, why we're going out and talking to folks. But when you, you know, when you drill down into that, it's not hard to understand that when people go to the grocery store and it costs more, that that is, is really troubling, that, that that makes a big difference to folks. And when they pay their rent bills, that makes a big, big, and that is clear, that housing costs are a, a crucial part of what's really hitting people's pocketbooks. And so again, you know, those those problems, especially the housing issue, um, have been coming ever since the since the, the big crash, right? And that those kinds of initiatives that are attacking and making sure that we are doing something about lowering those housing costs are, are really important to talk to people. So that's what we're doing. So let's go back four years. You were a candidate for Congress. Yeah, so I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> you were running against uh, Marionette Miller-Meeks, who's a current member of Congress seeking re-election. You wound up losing by six votes. Correct. What did you see in the close down of your race that you've advised Christina Bohannon to avoid? Well, what I would say about that is, first of all, that was a really unique time. Um, you know, that, that um, six-vote deficit was happening at the same time when President Trump was, was, was saying that his election was stolen, even though there were millions of votes in, in uh, difference. And we all know how that transpired afterwards. I made a decision to, to um, for, the, for the good of the campaign, for the good of the party, for the good of Iowa, to um, recognize that, that um, it was time to say that, yes, this election cycle is over. And, that's, but and, that's December. I'm talking about the close of October and the first few days of November. What did you see that indicated you needed to do something else to win? that I needed to. Or did you? Or did you see something else at that point in the race? Like what was your gut telling you in those final days before the election? Before the election. What, what my gut was telling me is that, um, that, that we were in a good position to win this race, right? And, and I guess what you're asking is, um, is Christina in that same position, right? Um, and um, I guess what I would say is that, is that this is the message we are taking to the people right now. Every vote matters. Your vote really counts. And we have got to stick this right to the end because it is going to be a really close race. We're going to have a close race in the first district. We're going to have a close race in the third district. And every vote is going to matter. 
Um, I particularly, um, t you know, today was talking to young people to, um, at the, on the Drake campus because young voters are really crucial, I think, in, in this race. That 18 to 34-year-old group is one of the largest voting blocks we have, and they have the poorest record for getting to the polls. And, and the, the one thing that, that is more important to tell the people rather the voters rather than to tell Christina is that you've got to show up for her. She has run a tremendous race. Um, she is really working hard. So is Lenan Bacom. It's up to the voters to get to the, to the uh, voting poll and make a difference. Because the worst thing that can happen, which happened to me, is to have people come to you the day after the election and say, oh, Rita, I totally forgot to vote. I'm really sorry. I thought you had this in the bag. I thought you would win. And so I'm really sorry. That is really horrible to hear. <laughs> and so that's why I want every voter to understand that their vote really counts. And they lost a chance, right? They didn't get their voice to be heard because they didn't make it to the polls. To those two elections you talked about, for those of us who are on the other side of this and kind of observe and report, I, I think... A, a lot of us expected the third district to be the most competitive in Iowa, and it seems like that has sort of shifted to the first district. And, and I'm not suggesting that the third district is no longer competitive, but it just seems like there's a lot more attention being placed on on Miller Meeks and, and Bohannon. What, what what do you think has happened there? Why is that suddenly the battleground race in Iowa? You know, I don't know if I I, I would tell you that what we know is that both races are really tight. And, and again, if we can win one or both of those congressional seats, that's going to be a big game changer for us. And that's why it's so important that we, that we really get people to the polls as to whether, whether or not one is more competitive than the other or why one is getting more attention than the other. Um, um, I, I, I can't tell you except for that, um, that when you have when you ha only won a congressional district by six votes, that maybe is a... Um, a bellwether that says, you know, this could be a, a really great opportunity to flip. But is Zach Nunn any tougher for Lanon Bacan to talk to on abortion, only in the sense that Nunn has said he does not support a federal abortion ban? I don't think con uh, Congresswoman Miller Meeks has ever said that. Does that make it a more difficult uh, issue to campaign against him? I think they both have made it clear that they, I mean, they have voted um, for, for um, that um, bill that says no exceptions, right? So I think they're both in the same, in the same boat there. They have voted one way and talk a different game. We don't have much time left. Let's just briefly talk about legislative races. Um, it seems as if Democrats running for seats in the Iowa House and Senate have made um, the state program for private schools whereby parents get money to cover the cost of tuition, kind of a center point. Why will that be a winner in 2024 when Kim Reynolds campaigned for re-election and won handsomely in 2022 by saying that was her number one priority? Well, again, it's hard to know what people were paying attention to, right, whether they, and whether they thought that was really going to be reality. Um, and so now here in 24, we're seeing the, um, we're seeing the results of that. And, and I, th I think it just strikes people as not being um, smart um, governance to, to um, put public school education um, in a worse position. And, and Iowans are so proud of our public school education here. Um, it is what drives um, people to come to Iowa and to stay in Iowa. And they're proud of the fact that Iowa has this long-standing reputation. And so to see that we have slipped down um, to 24 or 27, whatever number you want to look at, um, and that the other states that have gone to this voucher system have gone down even lower. You know, look at Arizona. I think it's dead last in the country. That's where we're headed. And I think people recognize that when you take, when you divert money from public public schools and it hurts public schools and send it to private schools who are now raising their tuition and people are, um, most of the people that have benefited from this already have, were already sending their kids to private schools. I don't think people are accepting. And I'm sorry to cut you off. We're literally in our That's last 30 seconds here. I wanted to ask you really quick. Um, the early voting window has tightened in Iowa yes, because has. of state law changes and there's concern about the experience of the post office. 
Are you actively discouraging Iowa Democrats to not vote by mail out of fear that that ballot won't get back? To no, absolutely time? not. You know, it's, I think it's so important that people have this option of voting by mail. People need to be able to vote by mail. You know, elderly people who don't get out. Um, there's just, there's so many reasons why voting by mail is a really great way to, to vote. But they have, uh, the Republicans have shortened this window and made it harder. And that's, uh, I think, unacceptable. But what we're telling people is get that ballot back right away so that you're sure that it is in the auditor's office on the day of the election. Speaking of timing, we are out of it. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Hey, it was a great pleasure. Thanks to all of you. On Monday, Iowa PBS will host a debate for the first congressional district. We'll question Democrat Christina Bohannon and Republican Marinette Miller Meeks about issues of importance in Iowa's first congressional district. That district covers much of southeast Iowa, and it is a rematch of the 2022 race. Watch the debate Monday, October 21st, live at 8 p.m. on air or online. If you want to watch our second congressional district debate from this past Monday or our Iowa press conversation with force district candidate Ryan Melton, you may find those online at iowapbs.org. For everyone here at Iowa PBS, thanks for watching today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Elite Casino Resorts is a family-run business rooted in Iowa. We believe our employees are part of our family, and we strive to improve their quality of life and the quality of lives within the communities we serve. Across Iowa, hundreds of neighborhood banks strive to serve their communities, provide jobs, and help local businesses. Iowa banks are proud to back the life you build. Learn more at iowabankers.com.